Uh, well, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Simon Dixon. I run a, a branding, advertising, and design firm. In fact, Rocket Media was my previous firm that I ran for a number of years. We specialized in media broking, and um, that's kind of a complicated world in and of itself, even though I actually never met anybody else that did what I did for a living for, the, for those years. Um, but now I run idea engineering, and as I said, branding, advertising, design. And we have offices here and up in, and one in Washington, D.C. Just before I start, I want to kind of say what tonight is and what it isn't. I hope nobody leaves here being a branding expert, because it's taken me 20 years to get to here. And if you learn it all tonight, I'm obviously a very slow learner. Um, but what I hope you get out to tonight is some new ways to think about things, whether it's the way you are in the world, your product is in the world, how you approach certain things, how you talk about yourself, how you might talk about your product. Um, I, I really do think that everybody in any job, in any organization, has the chance to certainly think entrepreneurially. And, and every time you interact with someone, you are creating an impression of some kind. Uh, and being purposeful about that, or certainly how you are presenting your work, um, can really bring dividends. So that's kind of what tonight is. So actually, before I do that, there's a question I, I usually ask. And I often talk to young entrepreneur groups. And, and it's kind of cool, because this is obviously a larger community. And I, I get a real kick out of that. But I'm going to ask the same question that I ask when I talk to those guys, which is this. If you could have any career, any career, and I could stand here and guarantee that you could not fail, what would you do? <laughs> what was that? But what was, I heard something else. No? Come on, I want some answers. Okay, anybody else? Anyone? Young people? Students? All right, well that's actually not a bad thing. Although. Something I always point out to entrepreneurs, you are working for someone. You're working for the person giving you money. Or well, you better think that you are, otherwise you'll, you'll end up left field somewhere. Well, when I, usually when I ask that question, and, and it didn't sort of surprise me when I got some of the answers I just got, but people will give me all kinds of answers. I mean, I've had truck driver, school teacher, geologist, NFL player, uh, rock star. And my answer to, the, to everyone, and, I, and I, no matter where you are in your life and your career, I just, it's important to realize that if you said NFL player and you're over 21 and, and, and you're not on some star team, that's probably not going to happen. But other than that, for most things, the only thing between you and that career is you. And in what I do for a living, it's, it amazes me how often I run into people where they're the break on their own lives, where they've decided for some reason, because of their sex, because of their age, because of their training, they can't do the thing that they want to do. And, and by and large, that's just totally bull. People end up being the break on their own lives. It's not an external force. So I do want you to think about that, not just tonight, but going forward. Whatever the heck it is you want, as I say to a lot of these, the, 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 the students I talk to, whatever it is that you think you want to do, someone less smart than you is getting paid to do it right now. So you could do it too. Is anyone here familiar with the, uh, the various Dove campaigns that Dove's been running? I love them. Uh, and I've, I've taken to showing this the last few times I give my talk because I just find it so powerful. So I'm going to play it right now, because it kind of goes to what I've just been speaking about, and it just it shows it so powerfully. It was my choice. And now I will question myself for the next few weeks, maybe months. We had an option of two pathways to walk, and they led to two doorways. It was a bit confronting, actually, to be honest, to see these big signs and feeling like you had to choose and be self-conscious of how you perceive yourself and perhaps if it lines up with how the rest of the world perceives you. 
I went through the average door. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't even hesitate. 漂亮对我的概念来说就是，啊，像嗯明星那种遥不可及的那种。我走的是一般。Mas eu acho que é mais porque eu me arrependi da escolha porque era diferente do que eu vivo, é diferente do que eu do que eu sou. Am I choosing because of what's constantly bombarded at me, what I'm being told that I should accept, or am I choosing because that's what I really believe? I walk into that door with said average, and I didn't feel really good after that because obviously I had rated myself average. And nobody else. <laughs> Todos os dias eu passo pela porta comum e ontem foi um dia único e eu optei por passar pelo bonita. I wanted to go through the average door, but my mum just pulled me over and went to the door. It was quite a triumphant feeling. It was like telling the world, I think I'm beautiful. I just wish more young women realized it. If I had the opportunity to walk through that door, I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, I think I would walk through the beautiful door. Yeah, I think I would walk through Somebody really good looking back at me. Beautiful is a great word. So why not see what's on the other side of that? I love that. Uh, it, it's it is so powerful, and. Maybe it seems obvious, and maybe it doesn't, but everyone in this room, once a day, five times a day, ten times a day, walks up to that door, one way or another, and you will judge yourself. And you will deem whether you're worthy for something or not. Choose the right door. Be, think, be thinking about it. Where's the brand in this picture? That's a question. Where's the brand? The bags? The bag? Anywhere else? The star? Okay. Anywhere else? The, the what? The type? Okay. Well, it's none of those. There. That is where the brand is. The brand is in people's heads. Those are brand cues. When I am asked to explain what a brand is, I say it's the answer to the question. What do people think about when they think about me? That could be you. It could be Apple Computer. It could be your widget. But when it appears in front of someone, they will think something. And you actually have control over that to some extent. And that is, that is the brand inside that person. And it doesn't matter how good you are. If they think you suck, you suck to them and more importantly, to their wallet. And if you're good, or if, you're, if you do something, mean, I always think of General Motors, I, I have a, a 71 Buick Riviera, which to me was when the first generation of, uh, of GM came to an end, when they stopped making the best cars in the world and started, instead decided to make the most money in the world. And they stopped making the best cars. And so I, I consider my 71 Riv the end of that, that first generation. And it's nice to have GM back again. But anyway, um, it took a number of years for people to realize that they were making bad cars. They just still sold a lot of cars. 
but it was a slow decline as people's perceptions shifted. Uh, and there's people here who undoubtedly were, were lived in the 80s and into the 90s where General Motors just made junk. Uh, but it took a while for the market to catch up. They call it the brand gap. And funny enough, I'm, I'm a big car buff. In the, in the early 2000s, I really saw GM turning around and making great cars again. But I said at the time, it's going to take years before perception catches up. Actually, I think I said, it, uh, it's actually on record, I said, it's going to take Toyota to start making cars that are unreliable and killing people before this turns around. Who knew they'd come through? <laughs> I forgot the toy. I like to show this. I especially like to show it to people in the sort of 17 to 25 range. But frankly, there's some people don't get this their whole lives. It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. What I like to think of marketing is, is a search for the truth. Frankly, I think life should be a search for the truth, but marketing should be a search for the truth. And it stuns me how often I run into people that will argue and argue and argue about something long past the time when everyone knows that they're wrong, including themselves, because what they're seeking is just to win. And, and the funny thing to me is, the second you admit you're wrong, you then get to be right. So why would you put that moment off any longer than you, want, than you have to? But it happens all the time. And then this one I just found this week, which I just love. Albert Einstein, who was a man, when you think about it, pe people use him as an example of a smart person. But he himself... Imagination is more important than knowledge. It's not what you have, it's what you kind of can do with it and what you can build upon it that becomes more important. Fame is not a brand. It may sound obvious. You'd be stunned how many companies don't understand this. To be well known is not a brand. In fact, if her last name wasn't Hilton, she'd be bagging groceries now. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's probably not what she thought of uh, as her future. And certainly, most of us work for something else. But this is a person who is purely famous for being famous. And a lot of companies and people don't understand that if, if it isn't grounded on something, again, if you're not known for something, what was she actually known for? She really wasn't. She was famous for being famous. That isn't a brand because, going back to what I previously said, what do people think about when they think about me? Well, I would say vacuous might be the first word that would come to mind here. <laughs> no, that, that's not beneficial, but there was really nothing beyond that. I mean, maybe a vacuum would even be a better word. There's just really nothing you can say. In fact, I, I wrote a, uh, in my blog a, probably a few months ago now, it was still early in the primaries, where people were stunned by Donald Trump's success. And I was like, I don't know why anyone's surprised. Whether you love him or hate him, you know what he stands for. At least you think you do. I don't know if I really know what he stands for, but I know what I think he stands for. And I think everybody else probably in this room believes that they know what he stands for. And, well, yeah, everyone has their opinion. And um, because of that, he finds all of his customers. And certainly when I wrote it three months ago, but maybe even now, I said, it's a guy that you know, what he stands for, and then five flavors of met. You know, what does Cruz really stand for? What does Kasich stand for? What does Marco Rubio stand for? All those guys, no one could really come up with an opinion. They were just other Republicans. And so when people don't know what you're about, how are they supposed to glue to you? So it was no surprise to me what he had, and, and he's held on to that. Now, it may prove, it wouldn't surprise me if it proved, that he's already at 100%, that there's no more for him to get, that he's already found everybody that, will, that wants him. That wouldn't surprise me. It may not work out that way. But that wouldn't surprise me. But that's how he has delivered so well. And then frankly, that is good branding. This is my social media slide. Somebody asked me, what do you think of social media? And I, that's what came to mind for me. There's nothing wrong with social media except when people confuse it as a branding device in and of itself. And it's not. It's purely a communications device. It does nothing in and of itself except promulgate messaging. And 
If your brand or your message is confusing, then all social media allows you to do is confuse people on a much larger scale than you were previously confusing them. Again, not a goal that I suggest. I think maybe I left a slide out, so I'll just say this one. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about content. Content is king. Anybody heard somebody say content is king? It's kind of big these days. I feel very strongly to add the word good. Good content is king. <laughs> bad content is bad. Just writing pablum to throw it on your website or anywhere else drives people away. You know, I remember, you know, in my early days, I used to do a lot of auto advertising on the East Coast. And clients would say, hey, should we be in this newspaper? Should we, we should run in this. And I was, I'd ask them, well, well, why? Oh, you know, people read this. It's free. And I'd be like, well, what do you do with that paper when it comes to your door? I, he'd be like, well, uh, I use it to hold open the screen door. I'm like, okay, but everybody else reads it apparently, but you use it to open the screen door. It's why I encourage people to really think. Think about how you interact with the world, and of course, talk to other people about how they do, or at least observe them. Because a lot of the things that people imagine can help them, and frankly, even spend money on doing, really don't. The stuff that bores you probably bores a lot of other people. It's certainly worth talking to them about. I will take an aside, just because people ask me about this, on surveys, there's a reason why Gallup gets paid lots of money to do surveys. Because they're very hard to do. And the reason why is because people lie all the time. And they don't necessarily mean to. But they do. They, frankly, I think often people think they're helping you. And the example I give clients when they're sort of stunned when they get the survey bill is if I'm walking down you know, State Street, Santa Barbara, and I've got my little clipboard, and I walk up to people, and I say, hi, I'm doing a I haven't done this, but I could. Hi, I'm doing a survey on healthy eating. Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, sure. Love to help. Do you eat broccoli? In the space of about two seconds, that guy thinks, I hate broccoli. Oh my God, it's disgusting. But you know, I'm starting that new diet next week. And I, you know what? I'm going to eat broccoli. That would be good for me. Yeah, I'm going to. So it, it will be true. And he'll look at me in the eye and go, yeah, yeah, I eat broccoli. <laughs> now, as George Costanza once said in Seinfeld, Jerry, if you believe it, it's not really a lie. <laughs> that guy telling me that he eats broccoli could probably pass a, a, a lie detector test. He kind of is, believes what he's telling me. It's a flat out lie. He hates broccoli. He might try it once in his diet, but he's not going to eat it. Uh, I mean, I've lived the broccoli thing, so I know it's true. Yet they think they're helping you. And it's why someone like, uh, I just pulled uh, and Gallup out of the air, but when companies like that do questionnaires and surveys, they will tackle that question from five different directions, and they will pick up what the truth is. I often see clients will come and they'll, they'll give me, here, we've done a survey, we've done a questionnaire, and I look at the stuff, I've been doing this a long time, and it, and it shocks me at times how, well, the questions are just asked poorly, and what they've got, I mean, until, certainly they reach me, they've got a lot of really bad intel that they're about to commit money to. And they absolutely don't know their customers. And some of the things can be very simple. Now, I, I, I don't know what, what, who was really out in this audience, but I remember one thing I did years ago. Simple can really be, simple can be good. One of my clients, this was back in automotive world, so I represented a, a large multi-region car dealership chain. They had like 200 dealerships. And they wanted to start some kind of survey to figure out the radio stations people watched. And they, they came and said, oh, look, we've worked on this questionnaire. And they had all this stuff on there. And I looked at it, and I'm like, well, firstly, most people aren't going to fill it out. Secondly, it's not important to them. So they're not really going to invest any time doing it. I was like, why don't you just have on part of the check-in sheet, when people check cars in for service, Turn on the friggin' radio and see what station it's on. That's probably their favorite station. <laughs> Write it down. Do that for three months, come back, let me know. It worked incredibly well. It's a very simple solution that actually didn't cost really anybody any money. It, it added 15 seconds onto the check-in regime, and we got a lot of great intelligence out of it. This is something I've been working on a lot recently. This, this came to me. I'm now recently 
very happily married, but I was dating a while back. And there was a girl, I, I very quickly realized that, well, actually, I referred to her as heroin. I couldn't leave her, but she was killing me. And, and I literally pulled up at a traffic light. I still remember. I, am, I was driving down Carrillo in, in, uh, in Santa Barbara and pulled up at um, Anacapa, not that that's particularly important, Chapala. And I went at the traffic light and I said to myself, I love her because, and I had nothing. I still dated her for 18 months after that, by the way. That's, <laughs> I'm not proud to say that, but <laughs> that's me. And, and that kind of stuck in my mind for a long time. I, I really started thinking about that. And I came back and I realized I'd actually confused my words. I was talking about like when I asked myself that question. And it really started to occur to me how important this is in, frankly, all our relationships. And, and make no mistake, branding, marketing, is just relationships. It's just it's building relationships, often with people you actually don't know, but you're working on relationships. And love is... Actually, well, yeah, love is fine. Love is an internal emotion. Love is what happens to you when you think about or you come into contact with probably one person. And it's a wild beast. You know, anybody who is dating, was dating, whatever, you could probably remember back to the, just the, the wild stuff that was going on inside you. It's crazy. You're not really in control of your life. Uh, if you're with the wrong person, it will drive you nuts. It's this, it's this internal thing. And you probably only feel it for one person, and it's, it's very controlling. Like is very different. Like is an external emotion, and it's kind of quantifiable, and you can move it from person to person. So I could say, oh, I like this person, she's got a great smile, I like the way she dresses, she treats old people well, whatever, she gives to charities, this is my kind of person. And I could say, you know, I'm just going to pick on you, Matthew. I don't like him because I know he's horrible to old people. He kills animals just for the, for the hell of it. This is not true, by the way. I should be careful if I say this about a lawyer. I'll get sued tomorrow. <laughs> but, but I can quantify these things. And, and I know what I like or what I don't like. And so I can move that into relationships. And so you've got love on one side where you barely have control of yourself. And then you've got like. And, and frankly, as I've come to realize over time, is that the reason why most marriages run into, into trouble is because people pick their mates on who they love when they're just insane. And they don't bother spending the time to ask themselves this question, do I actually like this person? And that's what I did at that traffic light. That's what the question I was asking myself, do I like her? I didn't like her. She didn't treat me well. I mean, well, there's a whole list of things, and I'm sure uh, she could do the same for me. But that relationship had no chance. I didn't like her. I was totally in love with her. I didn't like it. Well, when, when the love goes, you got nothing left. You find yourself 10 years in, and you're like, oh, you might not realize it, but that's what's happened. I'm with someone I don't like. And when you see, now, now, now that I've sort of been ongoingly doing this work, when I look at magazines saying, how to get the love back, I realize that's almost never, ever going to happen. You can't recreate love. And how, how do you like someone you don't like? And companies kind of do this all the time. In branding, they go to one end or the other. Rarely do companies really get it in the middle. Tech firms tend to be on the love end. And that's the fame for being famous. I was talking at a, uh, well, it was, this was a high school, maybe the year before last, because now I'd probably even work at, at, at college. I talked to an audience and said, who knows what MySpace is? But one hand. And I said, MySpace used to be Facebook. They were kind of that big. And people were like, they thought I was on drugs. Like, we've never heard of this company. They were massive. But they had no connection. They were famous for being famous. They didn't really explain to people why they loved them. They were just, they were a utility. And I, I often say to companies and to people, you, you need to explain to people why they want you. Your brand, or certainly for, when it comes to a personal brand particularly, no one gives a crap what you do. No one. They care why their life is better because you're in it. No one gives a bugger what your product really does. They care why their life is better because they use your product. And you need to tell the story that way. Otherwise, they can't imagine their way to some better place with you. 
and you turn yourself, once you become just a laundry list of things, you become very replaceable because someone just needs to come along with more things or better things. So tech firms tend to be at this end. That end, the like end, that tends to be what I was just talking about with uh, nonprofits tend to do that a lot. They just list a laundry list of the things they do. We raised this, we did this, we built this, and you become a bunch of numbers. Well, the problem with numbers is people can have better numbers, different numbers. You've reduced yourself just to a pile of facts. Where's the love in facts? It's kind of boring. So when talking about yourself, when talking about your company, and frankly, this is in any relationship, by the way, including anybody who's thinking about being married. It's funny that now I was married. I had a start of marriage in my 20s. And, <laughs> and I remember going through pre-Cana. Anybody here went through pre-Cana? Catholic church, pre-Cana? It's genius. Oh my goodness, I have such respect for the Catholic church now because they sit you down and they make you prove you like each other. And you spend 10 days, and unfortunately, because I was in my 20s, I spent 10 days complaining, doing the thing the Mark Twain quote. I, I know everything. You can't teach me anything. If I had listened, I would have realized, there's no way we should be getting married right now. No, no, I was in love. I was going for it. And, and I think we made it to six months before we split up, but I, I wouldn't stake a bet on it. It's important to have these two in your messaging. People, it's important for people to love you, but it needs to be based on something. And even sales need to be that. I often say when someone sells a Maserati, if, you go, if a guy shows up at a Maserati dealership and just goes nuts and buys himself one, I always say, you better have a warm bed of logic to lie on for when you get home and try to explain this purchase to your wife. And I don't know really what it would be for a Maserati, but that needs to be there. And it's not just for you. Well, it's not just for you, to someone else. It's actually for yourself. When, when you make a decision, if you've gone through both of these, the like part is when you make the, the wise part of your decision. The love part's the fun. The like part is tomorrow. They need to be there. And when you do that for your customers, they have a reason to stay with you. So there's the excitement of, uh, that brings them in. And then there's kind of the almost boring laundry part of keeping them, making sure there's good things for them. I will remember this at some point. I'm not used to using one. So that's one of my cars. I just, I, I love showing it because I just love that car. That's a 71 Buick Riviera. It's kind of a funny thing. It has a gigantic motor in it. And the, the one thing that unifies my cars is gigantic motors. I just, coming from England where big is like, you know, 2.5 liters, the, the, these things, it's, I remember my neighbor once coming over as this thing was running in my driveway and he just stood there. He was like, that's a symphony. Because he's jump, 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 jump. I was like, that is the sound of America. <laughs> but I don't, yeah, I don't want to sound Trumpian. I just love this country. Um, it's funny how often people ask me, oh, what kind of mileage does that get? And I'm always like, why on earth would I want to know the answer to that question? Is there any way that the answer to that question makes me happy? I'm just glad that I have a company credit card that gasses that thing up. I will never, ever, in the time that I have this car, which I hopefully will be forever, do the math on what it is. Uh, I just don't even like to think about it. It has a 22-gallon tank, and I never drive more than a couple of days without filling the damn thing. But beyond that, I don't even want to know. But I always say it gets great smiles per gallon. Anyway, once I'm driving up State Street, and a guy calls out to me, global warming, dude. Now, in all truth, he had a point. I mean, this car is, is, is somewhat the enemy of the, of the environment. But it got me to thinking. Because we so often, nonprofits particularly, demand that people drink all our Kool-Aid to 100%. You're either with me or again me. I'm like, so like 95% isn't enough? Because I do consider myself an environmentalist. There may be people that laugh at that idea, but I do. Because in the other parts of my life, whether from a moral standpoint or purely out of guilt, I do try to take care of the environment. I do think about the environment when I make certain decisions or choose which habits to follow. I'm one of those people that, my new guilt is, uh, is Blue Apron. Anybody use Blue Apron? 
No? I, I love being on the cutting edge. Blue Apron, has anyone heard of this? They send you like food. So it shows up twice a week, food arrives at the house with instructions, and it's all the exact portion sizes. So you do actually cook it, but like there's no way, so it's, it's all very simple. Anyway, it's kind of neat. But of course, it's all packaged up, and this is, the, this is the big challenge for these new companies. And a lot of very new companies. It turns out there's hundreds of companies doing this. We're just switching right now. And, and so, I, I, again, part of my environmentalist side has a bit of a trouble with that, but they've already got their arguments worked out, which is, oh, there's much less wastage in food and this and that. So it gives me the warm bed of logic I lie on, so I can still say I'm an environmentalist. But anyway, the, way I, the, the reason I have this is don't ignore people that might be your friend. Don't ignore people that might be your customers. Be careful how much you demand of people. Do they really all have to be just like you? Do they really all have to give you everything and a complete buy-in? There might be a lot of very valuable people in your life, just in general, but certainly in your sales pattern, that aren't quite where you are. And hell, maybe they're on a journey. Maybe they'll end up there. Oh, this is the missing slide. Well, there you go. You, you might be saying the bottom line about me right now. So every year after the Super Bowl, how many people here watch the Super Bowl? How many people watch it for the commercials? Okay. And, and you're in good company. A lot of people do that. In my mind, most of those commercials suck, but hey. It's a lot of money involved. You've got to pay about three or four million dollars to open up a 30 second hole, and then you're probably going to drop another million or more dumping something into that hole you just made. It stuns me how bad some of the commercials are. And when I talk about idea engineering, the comp my company, I kind of make a point to clients. It's important to me to say there's no 25 year old creative directors in my company. I'm not interested in, in a 25-year-old creative director. This is not me being aged. This is the only experience. You know, actually, I'm going to take it aside. It stuns me. People come to be hired by my firm, and they'll sit down in front of me, and it's some 22-year-old, and, I, and I, I meet a lot of, of young kids, and often out of these talks, especially when they're at universities, I'll get students chase me down. As much as I can, I, I have coffee with people and whatever. And people walk in to talk to me, and I always say, they walk in with this resume, and uh, pardon my French, they've polished the turd that is them into this. And they're going to try and convince me that they're some sort of genius at 22. And as I sometimes say out loud, I know you know nothing, and you know you know nothing. How come I'm the one that doesn't have a problem with it? Because I, I'm the one that's talking to you. And so often in marketing, not just for kids, just marketing in general, marketing of people who are older than 22, we don't spend the time to figure out what the hell it is people are trying to want from us. We're too busy telling them what they want for us. Ask questions. People generally will answer them for you. These kids come in trying to impress me with knowledge. I'm not looking for knowledge. I will say point blank to them. If I was buying knowledge, I would talk to someone 10 years older than you who's been doing this for a while. Wouldn't cost me that much more, but I'd get a guy with a bunch of knowledge. If I'm talking to you, what else? I usually throw it back to them. What else might I be interested in? Well, first, how about being on time? You'd be stunned. How long? Maybe you wouldn't be stunned. Don't show up to, a, to an interview in flip-flops. You know? Seek knowledge. Frankly, seek truth. If you, really, if you said seek truth, man, you, you're probably going to get hired. These are things that are separators. And often people think they have no power. And that is for any age, and it almost goes back to that initial Dove commercial. People don't spend the time to truly understand the, the power and the worth that they have and where it lies. They're too busy imagining what it is. And then, but shockingly, it's often the thing that they believe they don't have. But we all have worth in some way. And frankly, the biggest one is just wanting to learn. When somebody shows up to my company and has very obviously done some homework. They come in engaged. But more than anything else, just seems to have a passion. Well, that's someone's going to get my interest because I can't give someone motivation. That comes from inside them. I can give them knowledge. They can follow me around for a while. I know a few things in all this time. I can give them knowledge. 
I'll say to these, these classes of kids, I could buy all the knowledge in this room after a two minute phone call for not a lot of money. And that's kind of even true right here, including me. Knowledge is kind of a commodity. But things like motivation, things like going back to that Einstein quote of imagination, that gets hard to find. That starts becoming something more valuable. And when you, when you can talk about yourself or your product in those kind of words, you start becoming a lot more valuable to someone. Anyway, back to the flying monkeys. There's a lot of confusion on what a good ad is and what it isn't. And a lot of people who make ads in the commercial, in, in the Super Bowl, don't understand this. It's not entertainment. I'm very lucky that when I was, I think as, as, as I was introduced, I came to this country, I was an illegal alien. I literally arrived in America by accident. I was a legal alien. This was back before 1986, so it was a little easier to be an illegal alien. And uh, they hadn't yet built the wall. <laughs> and I was waiting tables and decided I either wanted to get an advertising law. And so I started doing some studying and found out that in the United States, unlike England, law is a grad degree. In England, it's an undergrad degree. Well, I don't even have an undergrad degree. So I was like, that's a lot of school. I think law is out, because I just, I never liked school to begin with. I mean, I read voraciously, I, I study, I've just never been really interested in doing it in a school. And, but I thought, well, advertising, I've been interested in that since I was a kid. I didn't fully realize until much later in my life just how interested I'd been in it as, as a kid, but it turns out I'd been really studying it all my life. But I was like, that I can get into. And I waited on a guy, actually the first guy I waited on, he chatted with me, he didn't interview me, but he chatted with me, but he said something that day. The first thing he told me when I told him I was interested in advertising is what I'm about to say to you. It was true then, I'm, I mean, I'm so glad, my career is so glad that not only he said it, that I listened to it. He said, the good ad is the one that sells. It stuns me how often people forget that. That's the business that we are in in marketing. We're selling something. Now, I want to take a moment to say that's different than conning people about something. This is where the whole truth thing comes in. But we're selling. If a needle's not moving, the ad didn't work. Now, I'd love to think that somebody might watch a commercial that I made, press pause on the DVR, and flee across town to buy whatever the hell it is that I'm hawking. That's kind of a lot to think. But at the very least, at the end of 30 seconds, it'd be nice if somebody thought better about not even better, knew more, had taken something in, more than they had at the start. I'm going to show you two commercials. So anyway, after the Super Bowl, the next day, they, the, the USA Today, they, they do it in real time. People get to vote during the Super Bowl. They'll vote on what they think the best commercials are. Uh, I'm going to sound very full of myself here, but I'm just going to say it. The general people who are voting have no idea really how to vote. They're, 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 they're just regular Joe Blows. They don't really know what a good commercial is. The people think they know what a good commercial is. And what they actually are voting on is whether they were entertained or not. That's a very different thing. So, this ad, and these are a couple of years old now, but this was the number one ad in the Super Bowl when it ran. What else? Oh. You want a Dorito, you gotta speak. Speak. Oh, come on. Sound. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's fun. This is the ad that came in 45th in the vote. I happen to think it's one of the top three commercials I've seen in my life. No sound.
watched that a couple of hundred times and I, I still kind of get a lump in my throat when I watch it. I hope one day I get to meet the person that, that made that commercial just so I can buy her a drink and tell her just how much I admire her work. All they did was show the product. Am I going a little loud here? Um, they showed the product. They showed you what it did. And for some people, they might not know everything that Google does. I mean, it'll translate things into, into other languages. It'll correct your spelling. It'll kind of guess for you that maybe what you were looking for. You can put in a flight number, and it'll tell you when that flight's going to land. All these things that it can do that people might not quite realize. I remember David Pogue a couple of years ago saying that um, never use anyone's search engine except Google. Don't use Netflix's search engine. Type into Google, Netflix, and then what you're looking for, because their search engine is much better than the one that's actually built into the thing that you're looking for. Uh, and it's right, by the way. And they show this. And they tie it to this beautiful story. It's an amazing job. It moves the needle. I mean, I've, the kind of track record of Google points to that. The first ad is a ton of fun. But what do you really get out of it? I mean, uh, uh, I guess a hyper-jointed dog, an electric shock collar. But what has happened with Doritos in your mind? It, it's not selling anything. It's just entertaining you. And there's a great difference there. I kind of touched on this before. I brought a prop for the first time ever. Because nobody's, well, see, now in this audience, people will have seen this. But most people never have. And I, and I, and I well, anyway. <laughs> A few hours ago, I used one of these. Some guys know what this is, right? This is, see, I brought my one along. My wife, last year for Christmas, brought me toward the end of the life of these things. This was made in the year that I was born. To me, this is, this is why America, part of why America was just the country it was. They're so well engineered. This thing is quite, you know, well, it can't be that old, and it was in the year of my birth, but... You know, you, you turn the thing and you drop a blade in there and then you turn these doors close and it pushes the blade up and then you can change the setting of like how sharp it's going to be and, and you start shaving. This was invented back at the turn of the last century, about 1907, by the amazingly named Mr. King Gillette. Like, that is a mother who's got some high hopes for her son right there. <laughs> Mr. King, I always think, I was thinking today, I wonder if he ever ran into Prince before he died. Like, hmm. your mother kind of a king, well, I'm going to go Prince. King Gillette invented this. And uh, I think it's kind of funny that he called it the safety razor. Because, and I guess that's because if he'd more accurately called it the bloodletting device, it might have hurt sales. So he called this the safety razor. And, and he also invented a kind of selling that is still for people in the know, and people who have, have maybe some historical memory on this, it's called the Gillette sales technique. And you see it a lot now, funnily enough, with internet companies. He would give the razors away and sell you the blades. You know I mean? Basically, he, he invented the in-app purchase. Really. And this, this built Gillette into a big business. And it went on for years. And then he started getting encroachments of people basically making other blades and selling them to fit his razors. Well, when you think about it, if he's giving the razors away and suddenly other people, other people are selling blades, he's making no money on those sales. And so they tried various things. They changed slightly the shape of the blade to go in so they could stay maybe one step ahead. That went on for quite a number of years, but eventually Gillette, for more than just that reason, just uh, there's also technological reasons, but they knew they had to do something about that. I'm about to use this for the first time, and I'm quite excited. They came out with the Track 2. Can anybody guess why it was called the Track 2? It had two blades. Thank you. And two blades have to be better than. Well, of course it must. How did you even survive all those years on one blade? Now you have the two blade. The first blade lifts, the second blade cuts. You are smooth. Gillette sales rocketed again. And they were out in front, and they were the only people that made the razor. Well, they still gave a lot of the way. Somehow, I'm, I don't know how this has happened. I am on Gillette's list for some reason. They still send me free razors. 
Jesus. At this point, I, they, they must think I'm the only guy stupid enough to pay five bucks for a blade, but whatever. They were out in front, but much more rapidly than previously, their competitors started making blades that would fit. And, it, and in some ways, it tracks the development of the world, because as Hong Kong and China came on, which is what it was in the 70s, that's where the stuff was coming from. When it was just America, the, 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 the world was balanced a lot in America's favor. Once, once the Asian tiger started rearing up, getting those blades sourced was, was, was cheap and easy. So they had this, this track too. They did really well. But the time came when they made a move that will shock you. You won't imagine this. I know this one's going to take you by surprise. They came out with the, the Mark III. Can anyone tell me why it was called the Mark III? Anyone? Come on. Three blades. Why would you be an idiot and use two blades if you could have three blades? Three blades have to be better than... Of course they must. And Gillette stood and looked, and they were happy. They were the lords of the shaving universe. Who can assail us now? Oh, I don't know. These guys? They had just spent 25 years teaching the world the more blades, the better the shave. It's a number. Whatever the number of blades you have, the bigger the number, the better the shave. They had spent billions of dollars teaching the world that. And yet they were stupid enough not to think, well, wait, what if somebody makes a razor with more blades than ours? But they didn't until these guys came out. These are called Schick. Everyone's heard of Schick. In, in England, they're called Wilkinson Sword. They brought the Quattro and put the hurt on Gillette. And Gillette had a much bigger budget, so they didn't put them out of business, but it hurt them enough that far ahead of the schedule that they had wanted, they had to go to the... Notice what's missing on this? Yeah, no freaking number. <laughs> so they spent... $20 billion learning what you're getting for free right now. Don't make your brand a number. Don't make you just a number. You know, a simple thing I gave somebody recently, and it stuns me because I got a, I got, actually I got a resume today. I'll have to give you the name of the person, Mike, because one of the students here who couldn't come, who planned to come, fired me their resume two hours before this saying, hey, I can't make it. I really want to come. And here's my resume. I'd love to chat with you further. I'm like, man, that's my kind of person right there. But what she didn't do, which I encourage you all to do, it's so simple. And I gave this to a couple of people, and they tried it, and it works well. It's like, find someone to say something great about you and stick that at the top of your resume. A quote. You know, Simon Dixon is just the greatest guy I've ever known. He's, he's, he's good looking, talented, and if you'll just shut up, we get a lot of stuff done. That goes to the top. And then everything you read after that is through that. Actually, I, I tend to call it the brand prism. When you build a brand, we build a prism and then shine everything through it. And that was missing in hers. In this, they moved away from a number. If you have a number, you don't have that brand prism. You've just reduced yourself to a thing. It's a bar. You've set a bar which anybody can work to jump over. Now, Gillette. Apparently, they have me convinced, if I use Gillette products, my chances of sleeping around is really going up. So I, that's, what I, that's what their ads are essentially now. If you watch Gillette ads, ads it's, it's, it's a dating tool, apparently. For the guys who buy this stuff, that's powerful stuff. And you can't assail it. I remember, I learned this a long time ago, I'm happy to say, going back to my auto days. Back then, full-page ad in the Washington Post was $35,000. That's a chunk. And these guys would buy full-page commercials, and it would say, Honda Civic, 19995. And it took me a while to get them convinced. I was like, you just, you, you buy that. If a guy puts an ad this big on the opposite page that says, Honda Civic, 18995, all your ad does now is say why his car's a great deal. That's the entire reason of your ad, is just saying why his is a real deal and why you're expensive. And once there's one hole in your armor, 
Well, what else are you ripping people off on? You're obviously the most the, the more expensive car guy for selling car. Well, service is probably more expensive too. Why the hell would I be the fool that would show up at your place? This guy apparently gives better deals. And you've spent a lot of money, a lot more than this guy, to convince them of that. Uh, and I see that so often with companies, with organizations, and people that reduce themselves to things. And things is beaten. Be careful to create bars around yourself. Be careful to talk about yourself, to not talk about yourself in ways that just make you a target for something else that's out there.